House with Bones. Introduction to the House. I lived in a bizarre little house as a child, a place so unique and peculiar that it felt like something out of a fairy tale, albeit a twisted one. The house was incredibly tall and thin, almost as if it were an attached house except freestanding. It stood on a narrow plot of land, looming over the neighborhood with an eerie presence. With three floors, a basement, and an attic, it defied conventional architectural norms. The house seemed alive, a character in its own right, with creaking floorboards, whispering walls, and the sense that it had been designed by an inarticulate conclave of lunatics. Each floor had its quirks, some endearing, and others downright bizarre. The living room with its two fully functional fireplaces felt like a medieval hall. On winter nights, we would light both fireplaces, the flickering flames casting dancing shadows on the walls. My father, a storyteller at heart, would weave fantastical tales that seemed all the more real in the firelight. The basement was another story altogether, in the very center of the basement, inexplicably, was a shower stall. The walls around it were bare concrete, damp with a persistent mustiness that no amount of cleaning could erase. My friends would dare each other to use the shower, but no one ever did. It stood there, a relic of some forgotten purpose, a sentinel of the house's strangeness. The backyard was comically small, a patch of grass so tiny that you could not take five paces without hitting the fence. My mother tried to plant a garden once, but there was hardly enough space for anything to grow. We made the best of it, playing games that required no running and holding picnics that felt more like cramped tea parties. One of the house's most intriguing features was the old-timey rope pull of dumbwaiter that led from the kitchen to my bedroom. As a child, I found endless joy in sending notes, toys, and snacks up and down, imagining it was a secret elevator to a world of adventure. My sister and I would play spy games, whispering coded messages into the dumbwaiter, convinced that it was our link to a hidden realm. Despite its eccentricities, I loved that weird little place. It was a house full of memories, both joyous and strange. Unfortunately, it was incredibly old, and half of its charm was the fact that it seemed to be held together by whimsy and good fortune. As time passed, the repair costs mounted, and my parents decided it was time to move. The decision was heart-wrenching, but practicality won out in the end. Discovery of the attic, preparing for the move, was a chore that felt monumental. We had accumulated years of belongings, each item a piece of our history in that house. My room a chaotic testament to my childhood was the most daunting task. I packed most of my stuff myself, throwing toys and books down the dumbwaiter, pretending it was a game to ease the sadness of leaving. One day, while clearing out my closet, I discovered a feature I hadn't noticed before, an attic entrance in the roof. It was a small, almost hidden hatch that had been concealed by piles of clothes and boxes. My heart raced with the thrill of discovery. Being an adventurous kid, I couldn't resist the urge to explore. I opened the hatch, stood on the makeshift brick of clothes I had created, and hoisted myself up into the attic. The first thing I noticed was that it wasn't as dark as it should have been. 
The place was strung with old red Christmas lights, their dim glow casting eerie shadows across the space. A dozen little cracks and holes peeped down into all the bedrooms below, allowing faint streams of light to filter in and out, creating a patchwork of illumination that added to the attic's ghostly ambience. The second thing I noticed was that the place was set up for habitation. The insulation had been plasticed away, creating makeshift walls. An old gurney, piled with sleeping bags and sheets, stood in the center. Next to it was a rusted mint green refrigerator, which to my amazement still worked when I tested it. The hum of the refrigerator was a jarring reminder of normalcy in an otherwise surreal setting. The third thing was the bones. There were a lot of bones. As a child with a limited understanding of anatomy, I couldn't identify them all but there were bones of every conceivable size and shape heaped into a series of piles around the center of the attic, small and large, clean and white, from every imaginable sort of creature. They were haphazardly stacked in a half dozen osseous clumps. Two of the piles were blackened, as if someone had tried to burn them, and the walls nearest those blackened piles were scrawled in dark bone char messages. Mostly they were just smears, but the word sorry appeared more than once, written in jagged, desperate strokes. That room had been sitting over my head for eight years while I slept. As I stood there trying to process what I was seeing, a cold draft swept through the attic, causing the Christmas lights to flicker. The sudden chill made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. I took a tentative step forward, my heart pounding in my chest. Each creak of the floorboards seemed deafening in the silence. I approached the gurney, noticing more details now. The sheets were stained and tattered, the sleeping bags moth-eaten and covered in a thin layer of dust. The refrigerator hummed quietly, an unsettlingly mundane sound in such a macabre setting. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. My eyes darted to the corners of the attic, but the dim, flickering light made it difficult to see anything clearly. The walls were covered in more than just smears. There were symbols and drawings, crude and unsettling, painted in the same dark substance. Among them, I noticed a series of tally marks as if someone had been keeping track of something, or someone. As I backed away from the gurney, my foot struck something hard. I looked down to see a small, ornate box half hidden under a pile of bones. Curiosity got the better of me, and I knelt down to open it. Inside, I found an assortment of trinkets, old coins, tarnished jewelry, and a stack of faded photographs. The photographs were the most disturbing. They depicted various families, including mine, all posed in front of the bizarre little house. Each photo, had a date scrawled on the back, and I noticed with a shiver that the dates spanned decades. One photograph in particular caught my eye. It was of a family I didn't recognize, standing in front of the house with forced smiles. The date on the back was from the 1920s. I turned the photo over again, examining the faces more closely. In the background, in one of the attic windows, I could make out a shadowy figure, almost imperceptible, watching the family. A loud creak from above startled me, and I nearly dropped the photo. I glanced up at the ceiling, where the sound had come from. My heart raced as I realized that the creaking was not random. It was rhythmic, like footsteps. The realization that someone or something 
might be up there with me sent a jolt of terror through my body. I bolted for the attic entrance, not daring to look back. As I scrambled down through the hole, I heard a faint whisper, so soft I almost thought I imagined it. Don't leave me. I slammed the attic door shut and sat on the floor, trying to catch my breath, my mind racing with fear and confusion. My parents heard the noise and rushed to see what had happened. I couldn't find the words to explain the horror I had just encountered. All I could manage was a stammered account of the bones and the whispering. My parents exchanged worried glances and decided it was time to leave the house immediately. We packed the remaining essentials in a hurried frenzy, not caring about the orderliness or the completeness of our packing. The moving truck arrived sooner than expected, and within hours we were driving away from the house that had been our home for so many years. As the house receded into the distance, I couldn't help but glance back, half expecting to see the shadowy figure in the attic window one last time. But the windows remained dark, and the house stood silent and still, a haunted relic of our past. Initial Reactions and Investigation Life after moving was supposed to be a fresh start, but the shadow of the old house loomed large in my mind. Our new home was a modest, single-story house in a quiet neighborhood. It was everything the old house was not, bright, modern, and ordinary. Yet it lacked the charm and the sense of history that had defined my childhood home. Despite this, my parents seemed relieved to be free of the burden of constant repairs and the eerie atmosphere of the old house. However, I was not so easily able to move on. The attic and its grisly contents haunted my thoughts, infiltrating my dreams and turning them into nightmares. Every night, I dreamt of bones and whispers, of dark figures lurking in the shadows, watching me with hollow eyes. I became obsessed with understanding what I had seen, with uncovering the secrets that had been hidden in that attic for decades. I started spending hours at the local library, poring over old newspapers and historical records, trying to piece together the history of the house. What I discovered only deepened the mystery. The house had been built in the late 1800s by a wealthy, reclusive family. Over the years, it had passed through many hands, each owner seemingly more troubled than the last. There were rumors of disappearances, strange noises, and ghostly apparitions. The more I learned, the more convinced I became that the house was cursed. One day, while sifting through microfilms of old newspapers, I came across an article that sent chills down my spine. It was a small, obscure piece from the 1920s about a family that had lived in the house. The article mentioned a tragic fire that had claimed the lives of the entire family, except for one, a young girl who had mysteriously vanished, never to be seen again. The article was accompanied by a photograph, the same photograph I had found in the attic with the shadowy figure in the background. Armed with this new information, I decided to delve deeper into the story of the missing girl. I visited local historical societies, interviewed elderly residents, and even reached out to distant relatives of the families who had lived in the house. I uncovered a pattern of tragedy and loss that seemed to follow anyone who dared to live there. Each family had experienced some form of misfortune. Accidents, illnesses, unexplained deaths. Life after moving. 
Despite the passage of time, the memories of the house and its secrets never left me. They lingered at the edges of my consciousness, a constant, gnawing presence. My parents, on the other hand, seemed to adapt well to our new life. They busied themselves with work and new hobbies, their relief palpable. They never spoke of the old house, as if acknowledging it would give it power over us again. As I grew older, my obsession with the house and its mysteries only intensified. I kept my research hidden from my parents, not wanting to worry them or rekindle their own fears. My room in our new house became a makeshift archive, filled with boxes of documents, photographs and notes. I compiled a timeline of events, tracking the house's dark history and the lives it had touched. I also began experiencing strange occurrences in our new home. Objects would move on their own, shadows would flit across my peripheral vision, and at night I would hear faint whispers. It was as if the house's malevolent presence had followed us, refusing to let me go. I couldn't help but wonder if my continued investigation was somehow inviting the darkness into our lives. One particularly disturbing incident occurred on a stormy night. I was alone in my room, surrounded by my research materials, when the power suddenly went out. The house was plunged into darkness, and I felt a chill creep up my spine. I fumbled for a flashlight, and, in its weak beam, saw a figure standing at the foot of my bed. It was the same gaunt, spectral figure I had seen in the attic. Don't leave me, it whispered, its voice filled with sorrow. I screamed, dropping the flashlight and plunging the room into darkness once more. My parents rushed in, finding me trembling and incoherent. They tried to reassure me, attributing my fear to an overactive imagination and the stress of the storm. But I knew what I had seen, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the figure was a harbinger of something much darker. Return to the house. Years passed, and I tried to move on with my life. I went to college, found a job, and eventually moved into my own apartment. Yet, the memories of the house and its secrets continued to haunt me. My nights were plagued by the same recurring nightmares, and the whispers never truly faded. They became a part of me, a constant reminder of the darkness I had encountered. When my parents passed away, I inherited the house. Against my better judgment, I decided to visit it one last time before selling it. Part of me hoped that returning would bring closure, while another part feared what I might find. The house was even more decrepit than I remembered, its walls sagging and the paint peeling. It stood as a monument to the past, a relic of a time that seemed both distant and ever-present. As I approached the front door, I felt a sense of dread wash over me. The air was thick with the weight of history, and the house seemed to groan in response to my presence. I hesitated for a moment before stepping inside, the familiar creak of the floorboards echoing in the silence. The interior was unchanged, frozen in time. Dust coated every surface, and cobwebs hung like ghostly curtains from the ceiling. I made my way through the rooms, each one filled with echoes of my childhood. The memories were bittersweet, tinged with the sadness of loss and the fear of the unknown. When I finally gathered the courage to enter the attic again, I found it exactly as I had left it. The Christmas lights still flickered weakly, casting their eerie glow. The gurney, the refrigerator, 
and the piles of bones remained untouched. As I stood there, memories flooding back, I heard that whisper again, louder this time. Don't leave me. My heart pounded in my chest as I turned to see a figure emerging from the shadows. It was a gaunt, spectral figure with hollow eyes and a sorrowful expression. It reached out to me with bony fingers and I was frozen with fear. The figure spoke again, its voice a haunting echo. I've been so lonely. Confrontation in the Attic In that moment, I realized that this entity, whatever it was, had been living in the house long before my family moved in. It was a guardian of sorts, or perhaps a prisoner, bound to the attic by some ancient curse. It had watched over generations of families, trapped in its own perpetual isolation. Summoning every ounce of courage, I spoke to the figure. What do you want? I asked, my voice trembling. Release, it replied, its eyes pleading. Break the cycle. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew I had to try. I gathered the bones, carefully placing them in a large sack. The figure watched silently as I worked, its presence a constant reminder of the house's dark history. I took the bones to a nearby forest and buried them, saying a quiet prayer for whatever spirits might be bound to them. When I returned to the house, the attic felt different. The oppressive atmosphere had lifted and the Christmas lights had finally gone dark. The figure was gone, its presence no longer lingering in the shadows. Resolution and Aftermath Selling the house was surprisingly easy. A young couple, charmed by its unique architecture and history, bought it without hesitation. I didn't mention the attic or the bones, feeling that those secrets had finally been laid to rest. As I handed over the keys, I felt a sense of relief wash over me, as if a great weight had been lifted from my shoulders. Yet, the experience had changed me. The whispers still haunted my dreams, but they no longer filled me with dread. Instead, they were a reminder of the connection I had forged with the past, of the lives that had intersected with mine through that peculiar house. I had broken the cycle, but the memories would always be a part of me. Sometimes, in the quiet moments of the night, I still hear that whisper, thank you. And I wonder if, in some small way, I finally gave that restless spirit the peace it had sought for so long. Despite my efforts to move on, the house and its secrets remained a part of my life. I wrote about my experiences, detailing the history of the house and the strange occurrences that had taken place there. The book became a bestseller, and I was invited to speak at numerous events and interviews. People were fascinated by the story, drawn to the mystery and the eerie charm of the house. Through my writing,
Thank you.